The problem with growing camellias is camellias are grown by older citizens. Mm -hmm. The problem with older citizens is they don't get any older when they die. And I'm going to show you some of these people today. Camellias were brought into this country by men of means. In the 40s, 50s, and 60s, camellias were grown by men of means. Now, what do I mean by that? They were doctors, plant pathologists, lawyers and accountants, professors, insurance executives, botanists, scientists, nurserymen, rich plant fanciers, camellia growing and showing was strictly a man's hobby. Men wore shirts and ties when they went to the camellia club. Most of the people belonged to the men's camellia club. The early camellia clubs and societies consisted of men that employed full-time gardeners. They went to the meetings dressed in coats and ties. Like Tallahassee, a lot of camellia societies had no women policies. Women didn't go to the show. These two gentlemen, I know that you know the flower Leroy Smith. That's who's standing on the left. He was a member of the society since about the inception. He was a barber. He cut hair in Tallahassee. He had a barber shop right down the street from, from the Capitol, and he cut all the governor's hairs and all that. The man on the right is Bob Gramling. Mr. Gramling was involved in government because he built prisons. He designed and built prisons to keep people in. In 1958, the Camellia Society published a book entitled Camellia Culture by Carl Truget. It was published in 1958, okay? 1958. If you don't buy anything except Camellia Culture, I'm going to put it where you can see it in front of my face. That's what it looks like. Okay, this is an old one. For about three or four dollars in 2013 or 14 on Amazon.com, then I gave this presentation to three or four different places. Now they're thirty dollars if you can find one, and there is one on the alternative book list at Amazon.com. But <coughs> something else. It was it was published and put together by people in California by 55 very prominent camellia growers, and it covers almost everything. And most of that information is just as relevant today as it was then. Now, we've learned a lot of stuff since then, but people have forgotten about this book. It's Camellia Culture by Carl Truget. Okay, but in the early 70s, things began to change. Women were accepted in camellia clubs. Coats and ties gave way to more casual dress. Even jeans were okay. Ladies became society and club officers. The American Camellia Society included ladies in their ranks. Things were changing fast. What happened in Tallahassee was, in, we, we meet in October, November, December, January, February, March, and April, and in April, the Camellia Society, the Men's Camellia Society Club of Tallahassee met and, de and decided that they would, uh, uh, I'm sorry, they met in March and decided that they would include the women. Well, a month later, they met again in April and decided they would vote the women out. <laughs> what I'm fixing to tell you is a fact. After a summer of no food, no set. <laughs> They've met in October. They've had them in the club ever since. And that's a fact. <clears throat> for debate. That's what those women did. <laughs> Roberta Hardison, she is on the left. She passed away last year. She's about, she was about five foot tall. And her husband was Dick Hardison. And he was about five foot two. He had a he had a BS, they're both from Nashville, Tennessee. They, he went to the University of Tennessee. He got a degree there. And uh, he went to the University of Florida and he got a degree in public health right after that, just after the war. 
he was in the service during the war. And then he went to a foreign country and got a degree in bacteriology and immunology. And it was in a foreign country called California. <laughs> Berkeley. Can you imagine going from Tallahassee to Berkeley? <laughs> Culture shock. So all of the health department regulations for the oyster industry, the seafood industry, for the shrimp industry. Probably not so much in the fifth. Uh, mm -hmm. South Tallahassee. Really they live down in Apalachicola, Florida. And if you go to Mr. Hardison's breakfast table, which I did a thousand times, and you mentioned Apalachicola, Mr. Hardison would call that. He hated everybody in Apalachicola. It, ladies were included in all the events. You see the lady on the left right here, the little short, white haired lady? She graduated from Stetson in 1940, and a company called Eastman Kodak hired her to go to New York City to develop something called color photo processing. Mm -hmm. she decided she'd marry Bill Sharp and stay here. And I, I'm going to continue the story about her. This is at the convention in 2015. We got Butt and Tyler Mizell, John Wong, uh, Joan Blanchard, we just named the flower for, and of course, William Corey. This is during the 70s when women were in, and this is Hewlin and Janet, and this is at a camellia function. Now, I'm not telling you that Hewlin would take a drink. I'm not telling you that, but when he was in the hospital, the year before he passed away, he was having a problem with his legs. The doctor had him in the hospital and the doctor came in and he said, Mr. Smith, is there anything else I can do for you? He said, yes, there is. He says, every night before I go to bed, I have a shot of Jack Daniels. I'd like a shot of Jack Daniels. The doctor pulled out his prescription pad wrote a prescription for Jack Dan Daniels, sent the hospital druggist to buy it for Mr. Smith could have a shot of Jack Daniels. It takes a man with large kahunas to ask for Jack Daniels in the hospital. And that was it. This is John Wong. The man on the, on the right of him is Tough Willie. He's a cowboy shooter. He's a member of our club. That's Bill Hightower. There's a new flower just named for him, a new reticulata. And of course, we see Gary and Bonnie on the right here. You see the lady right here? Can you, can you, can you see my cursor moving across the screen? Mm -hmm. That lady graduated in 1940 from the University of Florida with a degree in law. She was the first lady admitted to the Florida bar, Delphine Strickland. She died last year. She was in her 90s. She died last year. Now, look at the other picture. Look in the background. You see the little lady right here? Can you see my cursor moving? See it right here. That's Pat Johnson that's registering all the chameleons. She's got over 10,000 seedlings. Mm -hmm. She's got 15,000 seedlings. And she, she's registered 110, and she's got some really pretty stuff. This is Miss Sharp again the lady that was the chemist with a degree in chemistry. Then of course there's Mark Crawford and Tough Willie and Bill Shelley. Bill Shelley passed away two years ago. This is L.H. Paul. He was at D-Day in Normandy. He was a member of our club. He left our club $140,000. He liked his chameleons. This is John Richburg. He owned the chameleon nursery here. He's gone too. You got Stuart. Uh, these are three past presidents of our club, including the one Alex Henson on the right here. All these people were members of the year for Tallahassee. Now, let's look here. You see Dick Hardison. This was taken in the early 80s. Dick Hardison, Randolph Mathis, Leroy Smith, uh, Marion Lawless, Bob Gramling, and George Lumsden. There's a flower named for George Lumsden, the man on the far right. These are the men that got me, that made the deal with me that uh, they would give me all the camellias that they have if I would agree to, as long as I was alive, there would be a Tallahassee Camellia Club and that I would share everything that I had. You see the two here, Leroy Smith and Bob Gramling? 
those two men would not share anything with one another. <laughs> they were in competition, and it was like they had each other by the throat, and they was about to choke each other out. So they sat down at Dick Hardison's, and they said, Randolph, we want to make a deal with you. And so they made the deal. Next year, uh, Leroy Smith, uh, Bob Gremling gave me a sign of something that Leroy had been trying to get. And so I, I grafted it. And the next year I gave it to Leroy and Leroy came to me and he said, Randolph, and, no, Bob Gremling came to me and he said, Randolph, did you give that to Leroy? I said, yes, sir, I did. He said, why did you do that? I said, I gave my word I would do that. You want me to break my word? He held his head down and said, no, I don't guess I do. Now, Jim Keeler, the man on the left, he is the authority on seashells. He's dead now. Bob Gramley, Hewlin Smith, and you've all heard of the famous Roscoe Dean from Loosedale, Mississippi. The man that grafted all the camellias out there near where Glenn Reed is now, that's him. He died of he died a few years ago. He had a heart attack while riding a bicycle. And you can tell he's not a big man. He's slim riding a bicycle in the National Forest over Mississippi and died. This is Ray Gentry from Jackson, Mississippi. That's Walter Holmeyer. By the way, remember I showed you the book that I, you can see my picture. You see it here? No, I can't see it. Yeah, that's what it belonged to. It's got Holmeyer wrote right across the top right there. Right there. This is Walter Holmeyer's personal copy of Camellia Culture. Conrad Hooper that came and helped me dig graphs the last three weeks. This was his dad's copy, and he brought it to me. Walter Holmeyer, the man that developed Frank Hauser. That's Paul Gilly from over at Grand Ridge. Had a little bitty shade house like that. It was about 10 by 10. He heated it with a 100-watt light bulb. Hmm. This is Hewlin Smith in his prime in his greenhouse. When he would come to Tallahassee, the people would just gather around and ooh and ah. This was in 92 at the mall. Okay. When I first learned about growing camellias, camellias love the shade. You grow them under pines, oaks, and dogwoods. You never plant them in the sun. You just plant them, water them, fertilize them, and jib them and get them great big old blooms. They bloom red, pink, white, and variegated. You can fertilize them in March, June, and September. You spray them with a little bit of Saigon and oil and Malathion. Viruses cause white variegation. There wasn't any white retics. The only fungicides we used were Ben Lake and Captan. Only medium retics were Black Lace and Betty Ridley. Grass for 750, rooted cuttings. Paul Gilly was selling them for a dollar. Air layers for five to twelve dollars at Dick Hardison. You graft in November, December on sasanquas and seedlings and air layers. You graft only the terminal buds on plants and pots in the ground. You keep all the grass shaded until they harden off or for the first year. You don't fertilize for the first year and you plant every seed you got and you never graft them until you see them bloom. Now that's what I first learned. And I know I went through that fast. Guess what? First of that ain't true. Mm -hmm. Camellias do like the shade, but not too much shade. Deep shade is a kiss of death for flowers. Tree roots take their toll on plants and blooms. I've seen tree roots, magnolia roots, grow 150 feet and come up in a pot. What can be done about those pots, about those trees? You try to raise them, put them in raised beds. Retics love the sun, especially morning sun. Try to avoid the 1 to 6 p.m. summer sun. Each individual cultivar reacts differently to the sun. This is Jack Glenn. It was 10 years old, had never bloomed at Howard Rhodes's. It needed more sun. The hurricane comes by, takes out four or five trees, puts it in the sun, and this is what it looks like the next year. That's a pretty thing. It was a Christmas tree-like thing. More activities the past camellia year. Two new camellias just named. Gail Lawrence, Steve Lawrence, Esther Lawrence. Three new camellias. This is Amanda Ann. This is taken at the National Convention. This is taken at the day of the National Convention. That is Randolph Mathis there with Randolph Mathis variegated. 
Hunter Charbonnet and I were talking about Clifford Park's variegated. This is a morade variegation because I'm going to talk about viruses just a little bit. Camellias pick up the same viruses as citrus and peaches, the exact same viruses. Dr. Simon Scott studied it. Look at the morade variegation in Terrell Weaver. But let's look back left to Clifford Parks. Look at Ray Gentry. It's got five different viruses in this one. Look at Giulio Nuccio. You got Tamara Supreme. You got John Newsom variegated, beautiful variegated camellias. When I first went to my first camellia show, I carried a Betty Ridley that looked just like this. It was way back in the early 80s. I went to the camellia show in Valdosta and I took my first bloom and it was Betty Ridley. And Dick Hardison carried me in to, and introduced me to Hewland Smith. And Hewland Smith says, come on, son, we'll enter that flower. Betty Ridley was a media reticulata. Okay, guess what? I won the best medium reticulata in the show. What? Yeah, I won the best. But. Really? Yeah, I took it the next year. They laughed at me and they told me that I don't have a medium reticulata category in Valdosta. Hewlett Smith had put the hook in my mouth and reeled me in. <laughs> the other medium reticulata was black lace way back then. Black lace. We were grafting on things like this. Look at the dieback cankers up and down this stem. We were grafting on failed air layers, stuff that you couldn't sell. Stuff that looked like this. See those dieback cankers along that stem? Look at this sorry looking thing. That's what we were grafting on. Then things began to change. Hewlin began to ask why. How do we grow better camellias? He got us to thinking. He talked to Mark Crawford every time he asked him. Hewlin had questions, Mark had the answers. We talked numerous times about why our grafts were failing. For 30 years, I grafted, and if I got 25%, I had a heck of a year. I was the man, let me tell you. One, we found one thing. We were grafting in pots. We were using bark in the pots to pot them up. They don't do good if there's bark in the pots. I'll call him back. Jack, mute yourself, please. Hello. Hewlin would try anything new. He shared his knowledge. <laughs> well, we're getting it about that way. Listen, he's he's got a meeting on his iPad, so he'll call you back. Is that okay? You somebody. What time do you go to bed? The people that have made a real difference. <laughs> Forty-three. Yeah. Okay. I'll have. I'll tell him. Yeah. Doing fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Paul. Bye. People that have made a real difference in communities are Hewlett Smith, Mark Crawford, Jim and Elaine. Said he'd call you tomorrow. Oh. Okay. Ladies, clearly out of it. Button Tyler, Jerry and Carol Self, Paul Gilly, Dick Artisan, Dr. Simon Scott that studied viruses. What do you want to make it bigger? Tommy Alden, John Wong, and a number of other people. Jack Mandrich, Ray Gentry. Anybody know what that is? That is a red mite. That's what we call spider mites. They're not really spider mites. That is under a microscope. Now, instead of grafting in pots, we're grafting in raised beds. This picture was taken of raised beds at Hewland Smith before he passed away. These were Kumagai Nagoyas. Look at how good these rootstocks look. But your success rate when you graft in raised beds as opposed to pots goes up about 60%. Another thing is we were always grafting terminal buds. These are blind eyes. There's no terminal bud here. Another thing, notice the fertilizer all down here. 
This is a blind eye here. See it grow? Another thing, see the hose there, the soaker hose in that raised bed? Does a good job. Here's three blind eyes that have grown on this. On this. Look at this graft. The rootstock was laying over. I sawed it off, split it down the middle, and didn't even put it in the end, just stuck it in. Can you see that real good? By the way, you see the root on the left there? I could have grafted that sign in that root and it would have done just as good. Grafted it in the root because the root has a cambium layer. These are one year grafts. This is Jim Smelly's. They have never been in the shade a single day. Never shaded. Put a styrofoam cup over them. When the bud starts swelling, put a pencil hole at the top on the side away from the sun. And if the, if the, if the, as the sign grows, take the top out of the cup and it comes right out of the top. See the top, see the cups here where they're taking the top out of them? These graphs here are 49 inches tall. That's Elaine. This is the Marilyn Mathis graph. But this is what Smelly grafted on. This is Winter Joy. It's a cold hardy Sasanqua. Look at the fertilizer. This is my raised beds. This bed right here, I dug today. This bed in the, the middle bed, you can see there's there's three beds here. And then there's two, I have two new ones that's beyond that. This bed today, the camellias were over four foot tall. Another thing, when, I'm, when I do a camellia graft, I, I dip it in captan. Then I pour captan on it when I finish. Then after one month, I open the top and I spray it with pristine or pageant, one teaspoon and a gallon of water. I wait another month and then I start with a tablespoon and I rotate it with copper fungicide custodian banner. I use insecticides such as oil and malathion with the fungicides. I don't have a lot of dieback problems. I don't have holes in the new growth. Now, I believe that more dieback gets in from sand that blows through the air, puts minute holes in the new growth and lets microscopic dieback in. And this fine particles of pollen and sand and dust is blown by the wind and the rain. Other fungicides we use, we use coside, liquid copper, Custodia, Bravo. Biggest advance that I've seen in uh, insecticides for camellias is we now use Abbott or Albamectin. It is a systemic ins insecticide for red mites and you put a quarter of a teaspoon in a gallon of water and use it with summer oil. Then we rotate with Orthene, Talstar, Portal, and Imanoclucoprin. You know, the whole, those the swiggly little holes in the camellia leaves, you know, the, the first flush comes in the spring, no holes. The second flush comes and you got holes. Those are ambrosia beetles. Hewlin used to say the only thing you could do for them was to shake the bush in the middle of the night and stomp them till they're all dead. No, you spray it with them in the clunkerbird and it kills them and it breaks the cycle and you don't have any problems. <clears throat> Dr. Simon Scott in 2013, he was a guest speaker at the ACCS convention. And I sent him cuttings with eight different viruses and he studied them. And he was able to identify the viruses because they're the same ones that virus peaches and virus citrus. And now we, I have continued the experiment because last year on different plants that have different viruses, I have grafted solid ones and they started blooming a couple of weeks ago. And each one is a little bit different. Some are more variegated than others. Dr. Clifford Parker, you say a few speckles. Then you see it with a the morade. Then you see it like that. <laughs> I've only seen one flower like that. It was not very big. The flower on the right, I wanted to show in Byron, Georgia with that flower. All of these are different viruses in Dr. Clifford Parks. 
They don't always express themselves every year, but they're all there. I have one of these Dr. Clifford Parks. This is the Dr. Clifford Parks. Look at that. I have, a, okay. I have five different rage entries that I sent him. Rage entry, very good. This is number four. This is number mm -hmm. three. Okay. Then the different strains of hog Look. pride that have different viruses. This is one that came from you from Roscoe Dean. This one came from Hewlett. Mm -hmm. This was, this was Hewlett. Mm -hmm. I think that was other. What's that? Oh, that was Hewlett. I've got a Hewlett Smith. That one's like two different yeah, colors. It can be two different. Yeah, it can be two like different. White. Uh huh. Did we lose him? No. You, oh, there you are. Instead of me. There's a pen. Good. Please mute your phone. I don't know how to. We got to be quiet. They can hear us. Uh, do you know how to mute? Uh, yes. Okay, mute us. I don't know how to mute. Okay. I thought, oh, wow. it's beautiful. Thank you. Isn't it beautiful? <laughs> when Hewlett went to a flower show, after, he, after the dungeon was over with, he always looked at every bloom there to see if something was different. This is <laughs> one from Dale Fitzgerald, nope. South Florida. This is Sweetie Pie. This is a sweet. Yeah, that's good. That's good. I don't want them to hear me. We want it mute. Mute is no. a big mute. Randolph, why don't we give them some instruction on how to mute their thing so we get this background noise out and you can finish? Richard. It's up top on the left or on the bottom on the left. It's called mute. All you got to do is just click on it. When you move your cursor to the top of the screen, or to the bot on some of them that's on the top, it's some of them on the You won't mute, Lee, trust me. That's, that's good. That's that's not muted. <sighs> it All is. you gotta do is be quiet. I gotta hear him. Shh, that man's getting mad. Shh. See that man old man is getting mad. Okay. This is Louise Fitzgerald. This is a sport of sweetie pie. Dale's Fitzgerald's wife was named Louise Fitzgerald, but all her life he called her Sweetie Pie. So when Sweetie Pie sported, mm. he called it Louise Fitzgerald. It's remember. a very large japonica. Today we got, instead of just one or two medium retics, we got a bunch more. We got Titletown USA, we got Mary O'Donnell, we got mm. Mary Elizabeth Dowson, we got Lady Ruth Ritter. And where I got the lines through the flower, if you're seeing that, I don't know. They just showed up while ago. We got Mary Catherine Kate, named for Miles Beach's granddaughter. We got June Curry. Things you ought to know about grafts growing in the first year. It's okay to cheat and water them from two to five if the humidity is real high. Remember, I said we don't shade them. Camellia grafts grow best. The temperature is 75 to 95. Soaker hoses work best. I do not graft terminal buds. Mm. Everybody always grafted terminal buds before. The bud swells, the camellia grows before it's callous, and it dies in a lot of cases. Especially in Florida, where it's so hot. I spray insecticide and fungicides three times a summer. And if you're going to grow retics, you better spray them. If you got a deer problem, put tomato cages over it. I graft on japonicas first, starting in... It's mid mid January, and I end up grafted on Sasanquas because Sasanquas break dormancy a lot later. If you're growing them in pots, don't overwater. If they wilt because you're growing them in pots, if you water them, they'll come out of it. If they wilt from overwatering, they're dead. Retic seedlings have to be grafted after the first growing season. That's very very important. When you graft your pot, when you when you plant japonica seeds, you get about one out of 2,000 that's where they're registered. Retic seedlings, you'll get five or six out of 10 that's where they're registered. But if we're missing something in the soil, I believe, so consequently, 
I had over 450 tips in 2015. I did everything right. I sprayed, I did everything. I watered, I fertilized. In a year and a half, I had managed to lose every one of them. Then I found out that Hewlin and Purcell and Mandridge and Homeyer, they grew, they grew the reticulatus seedling for the first year and then they grafted it. So when the seedling died, they still had it. Roots of Kumagai, Kumagai Nagoya, the root system will be four to five times as big as Sasanquas and regular Japonicas. Today, we potted 53 plants that had been in the ground for two years into five gallon pots. That's the smallest they would fit in. The root systems were bigger than my head. If you're going to grow, put them, if when you dig grafts, you put them in the smallest pot they'll fit in. But gr grafting always makes better plants faster. Raised beds are the cat's meow for growing rootstocks. This is a graft after one year, the same graft after two years. Now, they do not grow together. The top grows down over the bottom. The bottom does not grow. If you see this in your camellias, your camellias are not healthy. If the roots are showing, all you're seeing is support roots. There's no feeder roots. Throw some sand on it. Throw some topsoil on it. Throw some leaves on it. Cover those up where the little feeder roots can develop. Kuma guys, when they, when they put on a bud like this one right here, it means your fertilizers run out. Kuma guys will flush five times a year, five times. <laughs> if you see a bud forming on your Kuma guy, break it off and fertilize them. If you're gonna graft camellias, graft as far away from your regular camellias as possible. These were grafted in the garden and where these are sitting right now, I've got 400 grafts sitting to, today because all these are gone. This is J.D. Thomerson. If you don't know J.D., he's the editor of the ACCS Journal and it'll be out in a few days. This is Celeste, former head of ACS, and of course, William Corey, the horticulturist. Notice, <laughs> it was, this rootstock was too big for a styrofoam cup, so I stuck a bleach jug over it. This is what it looks like when I graft. Remember I said we dug this bed today. When they grow, they come out the top of the cup like it, Jim Smell is here. The grass that I dug today looked just like that. When, we, when I started buying grass, there were 750. I don't sell any for less than $60. This is what I've been fertilizing with. Nine to 12 month. Harold 17511 and 9 to 12 month gray code 16410. Fixing to tell you something different now. I fertilize in October. <coughs> Have you seen this problem on your camellias where the new growth turns brown? It's worse. Worse falls off and the camellia dies. You know what the problem is? Boron. We got some Harold's fertilizer that had too much boron. And I was using too much boron in my trace minerals. Do not cheat and use extra trace minerals if you're mixing your own pot and soil. Camellias, a lot of them cannot tolerate this. The secret to the huge blooms, Remember, you just water them, fertilize them, and jib them? No. You got to have a great plant with a great root system. You got to have the right cultivar. You got to have the best of each cultivar. Just because you got a Clifford Parks don't mean it's going to be a superior one. You got to use the right fertilizer at the right time. You got to spray <clears throat> fungicides for your ticks. You got to have the right amount of water. You got to jib. And you want to get as far away from those trees as possible. What we're using for rootstocks is Kumagai Nagoya, Kanjaro, and Honglusen. 
I use almost entirely Kumagai. The best signs are from the proven winners. Hewlin Smith, after every show, he'd walk around and he'd look at a bloom. He'd look at every bloom there. And if he saw one that he thought was superior, he'd write that name down and write that personal letter or call him on the phone and tell him that he wanted that. When he passed away, his daughters gave me all the plants in his greenhouse because he had them in pots. We'd put, he had put them in seven gallon pots. In both his greenhouses, he dug up all his old plants, grafted new ones, and put them in pots. And he had a, he had a cultivar named Vulcan. And when I saw the Vulcan, I said, what in the world has he got that sow's there for? That old flower's been around since the 50s. Why is he growing that in his greenhouse? And when it bloomed, it was stunning. It was different. Beautiful thing. Another thing, if you want large flowers, you got to keep the humidity up. I was the luckiest man in the world in 2015 when we had the National Convention here. The three, what I did is five days before the, before the, con, the show was to, uh, convention was to start, I pulled off every bloom that I had blooming. They would be gone before the show on Saturday. So on Sunday, I pulled off every bloom I had that was open. I let all the energy go to the new ones and let them open up. I watered, I closed up my greenhouse and I watered on Monday. Every night I would go to the walkway in the greenhouse and I would spray the walkway, not the blooms. I would spray the walkway. I had the finest flowers I have ever had in the two greenhouses in all my life when the convention came. Even a blind hog can find an acorn every once in a while. I was the luckiest man alive. Another thing. Think about why something works when you're growing camellias. I lay awake at night thinking about it. When I was young, that ain't what I was thinking about at night. But that's what I think about at night now. Don't be afraid to try something different and then share with other people what you learn. This is old Graham Green here. He caught his first fish. Then he caught his first big mouth bass. Only it wasn't a big mouth bass. It was a catfish. By the way, Graham Green's nine years old now. Then Meredith Green, flower name for her, caught a bass and Graham didn't like it. He was sad. But the next day, Graham caught his first bass. Okay, we had the convention here. This is L.H. Paul the flower. We had the convention here in 2015. This is my oldest daughter, my wife's only son, Howard Mary Rhodes. This is my wife. John Wong, Mark Crawford, Nidra Mathis, and this is jo uh, John Newsom. Alex and Jane Henson, a couple of members of our club. Remember the little lady that's got all the seedlings? That's Pat Johnson right there. Her hairdo is right out of 1960. It's teased just like it was in 1960. This is Dr. Mary Birch, flower just named for her. Brilliant lady. She is the graphic design person for the American Kennel Society. Howard and Mary Rhodes. These people came to our show from Spain. This is John Swanson. His wife passed away last week from Gainesville. He is an ACCS historian. We auctioned off quilts at the National Convention. If you're going to plant seed, plant the best one. Don't plant something like this. This is a different species, by the way. Plant something like reticulata seeds, fine pure, holy pure. Both of these set seed. Retic genes are so dominant. This flower and this flower is are both of them are three quarters japonica. But retic genes are so dominant that they maintain the huge flowers and the huge growth habit but they'll take the cold a lot better and they don't get dieback near as bad either like most reticulatus do. This is Sherilyn Green, the daughter you saw. It blooms fairly early. This is the day before Thanksgiving in 2014. This is one of John Wong's seedlings. I don't have it. That's one of John Wong's seedlings. He was looking for a white retic that's pretty white. 
pretty white, white reticulata. It's called flawless jade, flawless jade. If you've got questions, <coughs> call this cell phone number right here and talk to me. If I don't answer, leave me a, a, a message because people call, they want to change.